Hello. It's ah, it, this is a really interesting topic. Um, astrological placements that are in dignity, and also focusing on astrological placements that are in detriment. So, seen from a particular logical standpoint, and we'll say afterwards how this isn't quite right. But it's natural that there's a misconception that in astrology, because there are certain energies that are said to function extremely well with certain planets, aka planets being in dignity, um, that you would want to have as many of those planets as possible. And there's also, so basically there's this kind of hierarchy, and again, we'll get into how this isn't quite right, but it's natural this misconception would arise. So let's focus on it first, and then we'll go ahead and kind of deconstruct this. So there's kind of, if you will, there's an, a hierarchy of how well an energy functions. Now, I would like to preface this, is no energy is better or worse than any energy, and we'll prove that in a little bit. But it's important to keep that in mind because naturally humanity really likes us versus them. It really likes, it's a part of our biological nature to kind of engage in this tribalism, and so it's very natural that somebody with a, a underdeveloped, underdeveloped sense of the human brain focusing on the, the the mammalian brain the tribal brain that we all have as well as the reptilian that all these different functions within us that help us to survive so the reptilian is that basic just eat sleep shit fuck survive mammalian is that tribal uh let's let's work together let's use tools at least limited tools let's be able to help each other let's be able to create social networks let's be able to work together my tribe is my tribe we work i i live and die by my tribe and we have the human brain which we've evolved over who knows how many millions or tens of millions of years i'm not quite sure exactly maybe hundreds i don't know but we've evolved to be able to think abstractly to do things that other primates can't do or at least it doesn't seem like they can do otherwise they would have achieved the same kind of technological social economic political uh, achievements that we've achieved medicinal achievements so here, we, it's, it's very natural for those who are not using their human brains to look at these energies and go, oh, wow, I want, I have this energy in dignity. And we all usually have a couple energies in dignity or uh, somewhere. We usually have, because it's naturally how our solar system functions, all these different orbits happening at once, it's very natural for us to have an array of energies. It's very, it's very unlikely possible, yes, uh, and it has its own challenges. But it's very unlikely for somebody to have just completely one energy. Well, that's that is impossible actually to have completely one energy or to have like two or three. It's impossible because um, I mean, I guess no. I, I, that's a whole other topic. But if somebody had like Aries rising, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus, like all in the first house, then I guess that's technically possible. But mathematically, I don't know how many millions, maybe. Uh, who knows how many years that, that would be to take for that to happen. But regardless, so we're all born with a, a wide variety, uh, a variety of energies. And so even if we have dignity in one place, we have usually detriment somewhere else. So again, let's look at the hierarchy real quick. Objectively speaking, an energy that functions really well as per what that planet has to offer is going to be said to be in, de uh, in dignity. For example, uh, I have Mercury in Gemini. Mercury is said to communicate. It's said to think abstractly. It's said to be able to understand and transmit information very effectively, very logically. That is what Mercury is all about. Uh, so I have this planet in dignity. Um, and I have plenty of stuff in detriment and uh, other stuff. And, and there's plenty of challenge. Okay, let's focus on that real quick. There are plenty of challenges. Perfect example. Mercury in Gemini, right? The energy that I have, it's in dignity. Its challenge is to be scattered. So I've already started like three different concepts in the making of this video and gone on random tangents. And it, it there's a point, there's a purpose. But I would understand, and I've long understood, how frustrating that can be for somebody who has an energy that's a uh, Mercury energy that's more focused, more fixed. And granted, I have Mercury in the house of Aquarius, but even that, that's said to be an exaltation. Um, and still, when it comes to practical thought, that is where my challenges are. When it comes to, not that my thoughts can't be practical, but it's difficult for them to be, it's difficult to 
builds in the, the earthy realm. And when it comes to comparison to a Mercury Virgo, Mercury Taurus, Mercury Capricorn, yeah, that is my challenge and that is their gift, to be able to build in the practical terms of, of the material realm, of being able to be to work a routine to be able to be steady for example when it comes to gardening and that's a really good metaphor for just thought process uh in general and and building on projects and whatnot um at least in some ways you know in some ways i'm, I'm very good at that but in a lot of ways i'm not uh because of those earthy energies for example gardening as a metaphor if i i've tried to have a garden many times before and i failed every time because that's just not my gift why because my thought process isn't Okay, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Now I've strove to, to figure that out as, I, as time goes on. And I've made progress, and that's what's beautiful, is we're all able to, and that's a whole other point to focus on later, but we're all able to make progress on these energies. We're able to bring out the best out of every single energy, whether it's in dignity, exaltation, whether it's neutral, whether it's in fall, or whether it's in detriment, or I like to call it exile. We'll get to that in a second, too. We're able to bring out the best in it, each energy has its gift that no other energy has. And we're able to consciously evoke, if for example, I need more practical stuff like I do in life, more practical thoughts focus, then I'm going to look at the earth energies and go, okay, what can I take from that? Like, what can I understand from their wisdom, their genius? Because we are all geniuses in our own way. How can I understand from their genius and make mine more complete? So for me, that's more practical. So perfect example, an energy and dignity is not the end-all be-all. If that was the end-all be-all, if there was such thing as an energy that's perfect, then we would all strive to be <clears throat> rising Aries, Sun in Leo, Moon in Cancer, Mercury, Gemini, or Virgo, uh, Venus, Libra, or Taurus, Mars in Scorpio or Aries, Jupiter in Sagittarius or Pisces, Saturn in Capricorn or Aquarius, Uranus in Aquarius, Neptune in Pisces, Pluto in Scorpio. Those are all the dignity placements. That's not the case, though. You've had plenty of people that are really shit people <laughs> and have had a lot of challenges because of having dignity placements. Not, not in spite of, but because. And that's what's beautiful about astrology and about life and free will and consciousness in general is it's up to us to bring out the best out of our energies. And if we don't, it doesn't matter what energy it is. We're not going to progress. We're going to stagnate. And eventually, again, we're going to, as scientists say, become shit people. <laughs> so, for example, Mercury in Gemini, we've already talked about the practical stuff, those challenges that I have. And, and I would like to point out real quick, I have Mercury in dignity in the house of exaltation. So my Mercury placement, as per the traditional understanding of what Mercury is supposed to do, uh, is really well placed. I'm able to communicate. I'm able to. I've always been really like I've been able to learn and, and understand people very easily, um, very effectively. Uh, however, I've also understood that these energies can focus too much on the realm of ideas, and they can miss out on the practical. And I've also come to understand that logic isn't the end all be all. That ultimately, I need to learn from the the partner placements. And this is one of the big points I want to hit on today is especially having planets in dignity but or having planets in exaltation. We'll get to that in a moment. It's essential to be bringing out the best in your energy and it's also essential to understand your partner energy. So for example, Mercury for me is in Gemini in the house of Aquarius. Either Mercury Sagittarius or Mercury Leo are going to be my partner placements, or in the house of, doesn't matter. They both impact us psychologically. I wish I understood why that, that functioned as such, but I, as of right now, I don't understand that. But the house, uh, the house is impacted psychologically just as much as our planetary placements, as I've deduced after countless charts and countless research. I need to understand what these two energies have to offer. Mercury and Sagittarius is thought by spirit and actually mercury leo is very similar thought by spirit thought by heart thought by emotions they are able to communicate their emotions so powerfully so beautifully and so so emotional a way that there might be some logical holes in fact sometimes there's sometimes glaring logical holes in what they're saying but what they're feeling still gives them an insight into the mind of God, into the mind of the universe. And this is true of any placement. 
any placement out there is going to have their own particular genius. Mercury Cancer is going to have a genius that Mercury Gemini or Mercury Virgo, the, the dignity placements, will never be able to have. Or Mercury in Aquarius, the exalt, exaltation placement, will never be able to have. Or for that matter, that no other placement, regardless of its classification of whether it's this or that or whatever, will never have. So it's essential to appreciate our energies in general. Going back to the dignity placement, is it nice when it functions well in our lives? Yes, but we have to understand it has challenges that are equal to the energies that are in detriment. Now, this can be a little bit difficult to believe sometimes because the detriment challenges are such that are, they are so overwhelming, so powerful, that it can be very difficult to, to not notice them. And for the dignity placements, their challenges can be so subtle, but they're still there that it can be difficult to notice them. So uh, I'd like to focus on something else, for example. I have sun in the house of Aquarius, so I have sun in detriment. Um, and like I was saying, we all have an array of energy, so we shouldn't be identifying with any of the energies because ultimately, here we are, this this doesn't represent our solar system particularly well because in the middle isn't... I mean, yeah, I guess the sun is in the middle, but we're looking at this wheel behind me, the zodiacal wheel, from the Earth perspective. So I guess if the sun is here, let's say the Earth is here, right? We're looking at this wheel around us. We're all experiencing these same energies. We're just experiencing them in a different way. It's almost like before we were born, and this is kind of dipping into esoteric. So if you want to focus on the psychological, just focus on that from what I'm about to say. But before we were born, it's we chose our different energies. We chose, okay, I'm going to have this gift, this gift, this gift, this gift. But all of these gifts have their own challenges. This mix of, this hodgepodge of good and challenging is what I'm going to incarnate with is what I'm going to bring into this life and see what I do with it and from there we could go into esoteric thought of karma and lessons and all these things that's, that's a whole other topic but long story short psychologically we have all these different energies and we need to bring out the best in them see that's another challenge Mercury and Gemini loses its train of thought I, I mean I know I got the gist of it okay now I remember now um we are all experiencing these energies. We're all able to learn from the different energies. So when looking at your natal chart, don't go, oh, I don't have this energy. I don't have that energy. That you do have the entire zodiacal wheel within you. Now, you may be skewed in certain directions. And that's what I was saying psychologically. You might have, it's like, uh, you know, like uh, Dungeons and Dragons or some kind of game that where like your statistics for your, your traits, right? You have Sun in Taurus, you have great practical skill, um, you have Moon in Gemini, you have great intellectual, logical skill, but you maybe don't have a lot of water, okay, so emotional skill can be a little bit challenging, but you can build on that through your life experience. You can level up and add to that if you so choose. Now you can build your practical skill even further, build your logical skill even further, and throughout our days, all of these skills are being able to grow, so it's not like you have to focus on one only to grow it. Now, to be fair, certain Mercury energies are going to focus best that way. Mercury, Scorpio, uh, Taurus in particular, you know, even arguably Cancer, Capricorn, Mercury, Leo, Aquarius. Very fixed, very bright. But at the end of the day, we have the opportunity to grow all of these skills in some form or another. And there's no limit to what we can grow. So even if you don't have a lot of, for example, Earth energy in your chart, um, now again, we have all of the energies there, so I have Earth energy, but just I don't have a direct placement in Earth, and so it's been difficult for me to be practical in this lifetime. I've focused on it though over the years, and I'm slowly but surely actually learning how to be practical, uh, even while my other energies kind of rebel against that sometimes. I'm learning, and we're all able to learn, all able to grow. So going off of that point, Having energies and dignity, is it nice? Yes. Do they have their challenges that are equal to any other challenge? Yes. Even if they're more subtle? Yes. The reason why we need to learn from our partner placements is because especially if you have a planet in dignity or exaltation, you are most likely going to be with somebody who has an energy in fall, the opposite of exaltation. So Mercury Aquarius, Mercury Leo, Mercury, uh, or let's do uh, Venus in Pisces, Venus Virgo, stuff like that. Um, and let's, no, we'll do that later. Um, or dignity and detriment. This is because we need to find balance within ourselves. So, for example, I have moon in Cancer. My partner has moon in Capricorn. 
And there are many things. Again, there are no such thing as one energy being better than another. Okay? So I don't think like, oh, wow, my feelings, I'm more in touch with my feelings than she is. No, that's not necessarily the case. In fact, in some ways, she's very in touch with her feelings. It's just that, in fact, that's actually one of the interesting things is my moon in Cancer, a, a placement that's in dignity is almost like full-on flow of that energy. So moon, for example, is, uh, is emotions. So moon and cancer feels so much and so deeply that sometimes we fucking need a, a break. We need walls. That's where moon and Capricorn energy comes in. And it says, let's create some goddamn structure. <laughs> so we're not just moody all the time and we're not just worrying. Like, let's be practical about it. You have a feeling, act on it in a practical way. This is, this is really important, first and foremost, to embody it the the opposite sign whether you have a, a placement in dignity or fall or detriment or neutral or whatever it's really important to draw in somebody else's wisdom that partner point placement and in fact i like thinking in my chart that way i find it's really helpful so for example my rising is leo i think what would a rising aquarius one degree do right on the cusp of capricorn what would a sun in sagittarius because i'm a gemini and again, for opposite partner signs, we have a practical guide right here, right behind me. It's kind of hard to see, but basically, but the best way to see it is we have Cancer over here, Capricorn over here. It's opposite. It's literally on the other side of the solar system, that region of space, that region of psychological tendencies, characteristics, undercurrents that flow through us, having a placement in that particular region of space to flow through even more so. It's essential to see our chart from that other perspective to be able to get keen insight into who we are, how to balance it. For example, I, I, my balance chart, if you will, my opposite chart, is uh, well, the signs I mentioned before, also Moon and Capricorn, uh, and, and look at the houses as well. So Sun in Sagittarius in the house of Leo for me, Moon in Can Capricorn in the house of Virgo. And that helps to understand your energies and what they could be, how to find balance in a much, much more effective way than just analyzing the, okay, what does it mean to be moon and cancer? What does it mean to be moon and cancer? Well, how do I bring out the moon and Capricorn with it? Quick note, uh, and those who've watched several of my videos would know this already because I, I say it pretty often, is the partner placements are more similar than not. So they're on opposite parts or opposite signs are more similar than not. They're on opposite sides of the solar system, but at the end of the day, they're actually more similar than not. Cancer is going to find its ultimate home in Capricorn. Virgo, Pisces, Taurus, Scorpio, Gemini, Sagittarius, Aquarius, Leo, Libra, Aries. I think that's all of them. Um, yeah. And it's essential that we find that balance within ourselves. Now, going back to the topic of this video, having a partner who has a detriment or a dignity placement that is your counterbalance that is your your partner sign partner placement is going to allow you to grow exponentially but first and foremost you have to understand a couple things if you have the energy that's in dignity you need to recognize that there are challenges that are unique to that placement that no other placement has and to bring out the best in it if you have the energy that's in detriment you have to recognize that there are gifts about that energy and that you have to consciously work through the challenges to bring out the gifts so that you're not just going in circles. Because, let's face it, energies that are in detriment or in fall are fucking difficult. They are very difficult. But again, are the challenges greater than, say, an energy that's in dignity or exaltation? No, not necessarily. It's just, it's almost like the challenge presents itself first and then the gift presents itself later. Whereas in dignity, it's almost like the gift presents itself first and then the challenges present itself later. It's kind of like the aura, you know, it's in the background. Either way. So, it's really important to keep this in mind. Um... And it's really important to understand that our partner is no less than us. They don't take away our energies if we have an energy and dignity. It's like, oh, they're dimming my shine. No, we need that balance. We need to understand regardless of whether we have a partner or not, but especially if we have a partner that has an energy that is the opposite placement, right? For one of these, dignity, exaltation, or neutral, or whatever. We have to ultimately bring out the best in ourselves. And if we have an energy that is in, in dignity or exaltation, to find somebody who has an energy that is in fall or in detriment. And one last example for this video is my partner not only has Moon and Capricorn, she has Mars in the house of Libra. I have Mars in the house of Aries. So I have another placement in dignity, she has another placement in detriment. Um, 
those energies too they they go together really well and they're able we were, we're able to learn from each other beautifully i'm learning how learning how to chill out a little bit when it comes to anger when it comes to reacting when it comes to acting right away when it comes to no fuck it, i'm just gonna do it all by myself because that's what mars and aries does or mars and house fairies mars and house of libra is like well, no no let's work together let's cooperate let's smooth things over let's not get angry let's be able to talk things out let's be able to work together um and they both, again, they, it's about balance. Because Mars and Libra, House of Libra, needs to learn how to be a little bit more, no, I'm going to do this. I don't need somebody else's help. I'm going to be able to move forward. I'm, I'm going to allow myself to get angry in a productive way. I'm not just going to be passive-aggressive. I'm not just going to cause arguments for argument's sake. I'm actually going to get to the point. And Mars and Aries needs to learn, fuck, like, I need, to, I need to work with other people more. You know, I need to, it's not all about me. Like, as John Lennon says, funnily enough, who has Mars and Libra, um, a dreamy dream alone is only a dream. A dreamy dream with somebody else becomes reality. Something like that. It's, you know, kind of paraphrasing. But that's what the sentiment was. And I want to say he said this too. I'm not quite sure. But it's also applicable to Mars and Libra or the House of Libra. Is um, if you want to go fast, go it alone. If you want to go far, work together. So none of us, it's ironic. We're all complete in who we are. But none of us have all the answers, and there's no such thing as the perfect chart. And that's a beautiful thing. And when you realize that, there's a kind of shackle that's taken away from you because you realize, wait a second, I don't have to be jealous of anybody. Nobody has what I have, and nobody else, like everybody has what they need to have to experience this lifetime. And if I'm getting jealous, then I need to focus on my gifts more, overcome my challenges, work through them, and bring out the best of myself even further. And, or, and, or, I can look at their beauty, their wisdom, their greatness, and learn from that. You know, again, I don't have a lot of practical energy. So looking at Earth energy and going, hmm, wow, you know, I have all these really cool placements. I mean, ultimately, all placements are cool, but specifically dignity placements, but I'm missing Earth energy. And we're all kind of, quote, unquote, missing something. It's not that we're missing it. We just have to develop it. We have to we have to discover within ourselves, wait a second, these seeds were here all along. I just need to plant them and, and let them grow and learn them. I need to learn them. And it takes time. It takes practice, uh, just like all great things do. But that's what's beautiful is we're able to learn any energy, any placement. Look at your favorite placement you don't have and go, I'm going to learn from that. Now, ultimately, can it replace your own placements? No, but that's a beautiful thing because your own placements are yours for reasons. You know, and at the end of the day, you got what you got. So make the best of it. It doesn't matter if it's an energy that's in, in detriment or fall. Those energies have beautiful gifts that the energies in dignity or exaltation will never have. Okay, um, so I think that covers pretty much everything I want to talk about this. I just want to do a quick list. We talked about dignity, the exaltation, uh, just for, for full clarity purposes. Um, I find this isn't really a wide, uh, you know, peer-reviewed, if you will, um, astrological consensus, but I find that Rising Leo is in exaltation, and I find that, um, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm biased because I'm Rising Leo, but that being said, well, in my research, I found that because, where to begin? Um, rising, rising Aries is in dignity. Sun in Aries is in exaltation. Sun in Leo is in dignity. And rising Leo, ultimately, I feel it would be in exaltation because I just purely astronomically, then we'll get to field research. And then I, I apologize again, Mercury, Gemini, its own challenges. Then we'll get into all the different exaltation, fall, um, detriment placements. I'll just take a moment. Um, the rising energy is ultimately about the sun, and so that's why rising Aries functions really well, um, because sun in Aries functions really well. I, I, again, functions really well in the sense of what the energy is, like how it it economically functions, if you will. And also looking at rising Leo, they usually have very powerful physical health, even though our posture is terrible. Um, and we're usually very stout, whereas rising Aquarius, I, I've noticed a lot of people with rising Aquarius uh, have died of drug overdoses or don't necessarily take care of their bodies or don't necessarily have the best health. Um, all love to rising Aquarius. As you know, if you watch my rising Aquarius videos, I fucking love that energy. This is not an indictment at all. Uh, I'm just talking about purely astronomical fact, what seems to function. This is, you know, and again, tell me what you think. If you, you agree or disagree, I'd love to hear in the comments, please, as always, about this or anything else. Uh, okay, so that's, now that that's out of the way. Um, 
<laughs> okay, so Sun, Exaltation, Aries. Mercury, Exaltation, Aquarius, as we've said. Venus, Exaltation, Pisces, as we've said. Mars, in Exaltation, Capricorn. Saturn, in Exaltation. Jupiter and exaltation in Cancer, Saturn and exaltation Libra, Uranus and exaltation Scorpio, Neptune and exaltation. This too isn't widely agreed. I find that Sagittarius makes a lot of sense here, for a couple of different reasons. One historical, um, just focusing on the astronomical fact itself. Neptune is in dignity, in dignity in Pisces, and Jupiter rules both Pisces and Sagittarius. Neptune is all about, it's the higher octave. Well, I guess that's irrelevant, actually. Um, Neptune is all about mysticism, about the meaning of life, but that's Jupiter covers a lot of that, but Neptune covers a lot of that, too. I, I think mysticism is the key word. Uh, and being that Sagittarius and Pisces are linked, I find that Neptune and Sagittarius makes a lot of sense for that. Being able to allow faith that's a big one too. I mean, again, Jupiter covers a lot of these, but Jupiter and Neptune are kind of blend in a lot of ways. Um, I'm just looking for another keyword, and we can continue. Spirituality, uh, boundless love. Neptune and Sag would function really nicely. It does function really nicely in that way. And there's been a recent generation of Neptune Sag here on this Earth. If, I don't know the exact dates off the top of my head, but it's, I remember it was uh, much of the 80s up until, no, I think it was up until 83, 88, I'm mixing Uranus and Neptune now, but it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, long story short, I feel like Neptune would be in exaltation there. Historically, I also feel that Neptune in Gemini would be in fall because there is a generation, uh, basically the, the generation that led up to World War II, uh, Hitler included, there are these energies that have uh, Pluto had Pluto and Neptune conjunct and in Gemini and I, I feel like there was just a, a lack of broader understanding when it came to when it comes to Neptune your logic doesn't really that's not it's game that's not what it's about that's more Mercury that's more Saturn that's those energies even Venus actually in a lot of ways when it comes to Neptune that's not what it's about at all and so Neptune and Gemini I feel was very challenged when it came to their spirituality and it led to uh, a false spirituality of war of violence of, of false ideas Gemini not functioning very nicely there uh, and again there are beautiful understandings beautiful intellectual growth from that period too of certain individuals who had nothing to do with the, the, the war or rather who were either on the, the pacifying part of the war who were seeking to quell the war to kill the war if you will to end the killing, to kill the killing. But there are a lot of really great scientists um, from that time too. I believe Buckminster Fuller, that I, you know, I can't really remember off the top of my head, but there's there's a lot of research if you want to go check that out for yourself. Okay, I'm so sorry. Mercury and Gemini, I swear, I'm so goddamn scattered. And there's the challenge. There's, oh, it's indignity. It's so great. Yeah, well, you know, try being scattered as fuck. So, exaltation. Uh, lastly, Pluto and Leo. Okay, and then we got the fall placements the fall placements let's see so we got rising aquarius at least according to my analysis uh and again there's plenty of beautiful things that rising aquarius offers that nobody else offers uh, david bowie jim morrison some of my absolute favorite fucking human beings on the planet on the planet let alone artists and just mm, amazing these energies are essential all energies are essential sun in uh, fall, Libra, Moon in Fall. Did we talk about Moon in Exaltation? Did we talk about it? Yeah, we did. Moon in Taurus is Exaltation. I think we skipped that. Okay. Uh, moon in Fall, Scorpio. Mercury in Fall, Leo. Uh, yep. Venus in Fall, Virgo. Mars in Fall, Cancer. Jupiter in Fall, Capricorn. Saturn in Fall, Aries. Uranus in Fall, uh, Taurus, the energy we're about to go into, very interesting. So we're, it's going to be challenging in some ways right away, but we're going to be able to make the most of it over the next eight years at the making of this video. I apologize if you've seen this eight years from now. This is dated, but whatever. Um, Neptune in fall, at least according to my analysis, Gemini. And Pluto in fall, Aquarius, which, interesting enough, is another energy we're coming up to. as a whole other topic, though, of how much does Pluto affect us astronomically? Why would it do so? You know, those are some big questions 
because Pluto is such a small planet. Um, I've talked about this so much, and this video is getting long, but just a quick thing. Uh, as per Pluto, why would it affect us? It's a very small dwarf planet. Perhaps, perhaps, I'm not saying it necessarily does, but the, the research makes a lot of sense looking at it, again, whether it's conjunct Neptune or whether it's conjunct Uranus in the 60s, that would lead to the huge upheavals that we experienced on this planet uh, in really positive senses because uh, it was in Virgo of, of, hey, I'm a hippie. I don't have to follow the, your orders or I'm, so I'm going to live my routine, you know. I'm going to get high and make daisy chains all day. You know, I'm going to go make music, whatever. Um, makes a lot of sense that Pluto would impact us. It, it seems to be making sense. But again, whether actually astronomically it's logical for it to make sense, that's a whole other thing. Again, maybe there's something in the composition that, that really resonates with us here on Earth. Maybe it's connected. It's, it's tidally locked. Its orbit is locked to something in the Kuiper Belt, which is the asteroid belt beyond Neptune. That's another. That's that's my conjecture because I do feel like Pluto actually is one of those things where it's like mm, that seems to influence us. But who knows? Again, that's why we need science. That's why we need to look at these things logically. Of why would it impact us though? You know, the planets are fucking huge in comparison to the Earth. That makes sense why it would impact us. And you know, the research is there, and the research for Pluto is there. But whole other topic. Um. All right, let's get to uh, again Mercury and Gemini. Um, and in the house of Aquarius. Uh, detriment. Yes. And lastly for this video, the energies that are in detriment would be rising Libra. Uh, and before we go into this again, beautiful energies. All energies are beautiful. So if you have energies in detriment, like I do, like most people do, enjoy them. Bring out the best in them, okay? There are gifts that those energies have that no other energy has, especially that dignity placement. Sun in Aquarius, or the house of Aquarius. Moon in... My brain is... There we go. Is Capricorn. Uh, in detriment is Capricorn. Mercury in detriment is either Mercury in Pisces or Mercury in Sagittarius. Um, I actually really love those energies in particular. Well, I love all energies. But M Mercury in Sagittarius, because of my Mercury in Gemini placement, I, I get along with the energy so beautifully. It's so helpful for me um, to, to interact with individuals who have that and to, to see art who has that or to experience art who people have that but okay moving forward speaking of jim morrison he's got uh, mercury capricorn right on that cusp and that mercury sag is just precious to me um mm, 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 venus in detriment venus in scorpio venus in aries i have venus in the house of aries voila and then we have mars in taurus mars in libra jupiter in gemini jupiter in virgo saturn in uh, leo saturn in cancer uranus in leo uh, Neptune in Virgo and Pluto in Taurus. So there you have it. Those are all the placements. All energies are beautiful. You're beautiful. I'm beautiful. Let's enjoy being beautiful. And most importantly, you know, again, I don't mean beautiful in a vain way. I mean like in a spiritually beautiful. Let's let's bring out the best in our energies. Whether it's this or that, it doesn't matter. It's all who we are. We're able to learn from all the energies that are out there. Nobody is truly our enemy. Nobody is truly our our lesser or our greater. And anybody who thinks otherwise has cognitive dissonance. Uh, you know, that's fact. <laughs> Infinite love to you, my friend. Namaste.